right, hello and welcome to the Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golan from Sales Pop Online, Sales Magazine, and Pipeliner CRM. Joining you from a lovely sunny San Diego this morning. And today I'm joined by Megan Rates, who is in the UK, just a little bit north of London. How are you doing, Megan? Yeah, all good. Thank you. Nice to be with you. Yeah. And so over the past 20 years, uh, Megan has been doing a lot of research on how people interact in the workplace and how leaders can drive innovation and engagement and and how people can get kind of caught up in in excessive busyness, stress, unhealthy competitiveness and narrow rather than broad perspectives. So today we want to talk about uh, the concept of speaking truth to power mindful leadership. So when you talk about speaking truth to power, Megan, what do you mean? Um, I'm interested in what I call conversational habits. Mm -hmm. So you and I and anybody listening to this have habits around what we choose to speak up about and what we tend to stay silent on. And we also have habits on who we tend to listen to and who we tend to ignore or discount. So I'm interested and have been exploring those conversational habits individually, but also how habits form in teams and then in organizations. And they have serious consequences mm-hmm. on at all of those levels. So I want to know why do we make the choices that we make? So are those, when you say that we... Uh that we make choices about who we listen to when we speak up. When we Are these um, largely conscious or unconscious decisions? Um, uh, I think they're both. Mm-hmm. Um, so we make quite a lot of the decisions based on the titles and labels that we apply to ourselves and others. Uh, so whenever we're talking about choices in speaking up and listening up, we're essentially navigating differences in status, authority, and power. Um, and, and much of that actually is unconscious or at least not consciously mm-hmm. reflected upon. So, for example, if I'm uh, labeling myself and I'm labeled by others as a junior employee right. and I'm speaking to somebody that has the label of a chief executive, in some contexts, that will mean that there's an expectation about who gets to speak and who gets to listen or mm-hmm. not. Um, But it's very contextual. So in different organizations, different titles and labels convey differing status and authority, and it affects the way that we choose to speak up or stay silent. So what is the what is the impact organizationally of uh, where people are very, very conscious of of hierarchies, of of status, of labels, um, maybe of personalities and that they adjust what they say to whom and their communications and all of that, like dependent upon those factors? Um, well, I'm looking at two particular, particularly important business consequences, mm-hmm. um, not just business, so sort of organizational consequences. Uh, one is that you might not hear about some things that are going on that shouldn't be going on right. uh, because people are staying silent about them. <coughs> Excuse me. So we know that junior employees in particular often at the coal face at the coal face, they know a lot of stuff that's going on that perhaps would negatively impact their organization. Um, but they don't speak up about it uh, because uh, they're concerned about the consequences. So one consequence of, of having to navigate power, status and authority is that you don't hear about some stuff that you really need to hear about. And we have a litany of organisational, reputational disasters over the last few years. You can point to uh, there being somebody that knew something that was going on but couldn't or, or, or wouldn't speak up. Um, the other area, though, is not just the bad stuff. Um, the other area that is particularly on people's agenda at the moment is innovation uh, and ideas. So uh, we need to navigate power in a way that enables people to speak up with their ideas and with their challenges about the ways that we are currently working. Um, And if we are part of an organization that can't challenge and can't come up with crazy ideas, Mm -hmm. uh, then we're really limiting ourselves um, organizationally and also societally as well. So those are the two kind of key areas that I explore. So how do you how do you go about being able to uh, you know evolve an organization so it can address both of these without it going maybe without the pendulum swinging too far to the other side 
um, where every where everything is being challenged and uh, and uh, you know things are getting chaotic in the name of innovation. Uh, yeah, I see. I do sometimes see teams and organisations who have an issue about. <laughs> people speaking up too much. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I have to say they're far rarer than um, uh, sure. the opposite end of the spectrum. So it's it's enabling people to figure out what kind of contributions are helpful, um, uh, how to enable people to voice, but also um, what happens with those ideas. Uh, and, and obviously some ideas are actioned and others are not. And we need to have an eye on the consequences of our response to ideas mm -hmm. um if there's multiple voices and we're dealing with it by shutting people off or we're welcoming ideas and then doing absolutely nothing about it guess what after a period of time those ideas get smaller and smaller and smaller and then the pendulum has gone the other direction and we're facing a problem so it's about i mean essentially it's about people first of all reflecting on what are our habits around here mm -hmm. and how are they serving us and how are they going against us and what do we need to experiment with and shift in our behavior so that it's more productive yeah so there's a couple of uh, there's a couple of interesting challenges in that i mean there's generational challenges as you know you're probably as you've probably seen as well as where um you know, maybe people expect to be heard, you know, and, and expect their ideas to be ad adopted. I mean, one of the hardest things, as you say, is encouraging people's ideas and their suggestions. But then you can't implement everything, right? And everything isn't a good idea. And being able to manage that is, you know, can can be quite a challenge, uh, you know, where you are welcoming ideas, but you're also having to filter out the ones that, you know, Mm. aren't either aren't that good or aren't that applicable right now mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so uh i mean uh, there's been a lot spoken about millennials and uh intergener you know different mm -hmm. generations and the capacity to speak up and there has been um a kind of stereotype around millennials feeling that they should be heard and voicing much more frequently than other generations would like them to in the workplace i have to say that our research um all the, i mean we haven't gone in specifically to explore that but a survey that we've conducted with about 4000 people so far doesn't play that out at all right it plays it plays out that millennials um, who tend to be more junior um, are the most restricted or feel most restricted in speaking up. They fear negative consequences. So one in four junior employees think that they'll be punished if they speak up with a problem. So uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, again, it's all contextual, but there's a danger in thinking that um oh millennials they'll speak up that will be fine they don't mind uh mm -hmm. we need in fact we need to stop them speaking up so much it's not playing out in the research that i'm seeing so i think you have to explore the, the context right. and as i said previously yeah your response to ideas is phenomenally important one of the one of the best questions that we have when we go and do what we call ethnographic studies which is going inside organizations to explore culture mm -hmm. One of the great questions, and maybe people listening to this could ask this question as well, um, is what happens when you speak up with an idea or with a problem around here? Right. And listening to people's responses in that is fascinating. And they're not, and the stories that circulate around, okay, well, I can speak up in a, with an idea, but nothing ever happens. Or I speak up with a, one classic organization that we work with. Um, literally, the phrase was, if you speak up with a problem around here, you, you'll you disappear. <laughs> <laughs> That's a bit dramatic. <laughs> uh, and and uh, th that wasn't actual, actually reality. Mm -hmm. uh, it was based on an incident that happened seven years ago. And right. so these, but these stories stick uh, and if you have a story that says if you speak up with ideas, nobody's listening or they don't care, then you are just you know, reducing those. Mm -hmm. So you need to figure out a way of re re responding to those stories and changing them very often. So how do you, as a leadership challenge, right, how do you, number one, make it so that it's OK for people to speak up, but um, they know that 
just because they speak up, number one, it doesn't mean what they're saying is is true or 100% accurate, and it'll be investigated and treated fairly, right? And mm-hmm. the outcome may not be what you were expecting, but it'll be a fair outcome. Or if you put forward an idea, the idea will be judged on its merits, but again, it may not it may not be applicable or the timing may not be right. So how do you how do you create an environment where people you know, feel it's OK to speak up and it's OK to put forward ideas, but they know that um, the outcomes may not always be what they want? Mm. So uh, I think the first thing that we do is we uh, try and make leaders or, or people in positions of power uh, realize the implications of their power on what they get to hear. And uh, we published quite a lot in Harvard Business Review on this around uh, managers being more intimidating than they realize. So the first thing, and and people are very blind to it. Mm -hmm. Uh, And in fact, some of our research shows that the more senior you get, the more optimistic slash deluded um, you are that people are speaking up honestly and truthfully around you when they're not. So the first thing is make sure that you actually know what is going on in terms of whether spe- people are speaking up with the truth and whether people are speaking up with ideas or not. And then I think there is um, it, it, another point is to know that it, if people aren't speaking up with ideas or they're giving you rubbish ideas, <laughs> it's, ju- it's just as much your responsibility as it is theirs. So you're not asking the right questions Mm -hmm. if that's what you're receiving. So think about as you're in a position of power, it's it's your responsibility to invite the kind of ideas that you need to be hearing. So and that the power of excellent questions, for example, around this is really, really important. If you're just opening your arms and saying, anybody got any ideas? Well, don't be surprised if you get a whole barrage of stuff that you're not expecting. But if you can angle it towards, look, this is what we're trying to do. This is the problem that we're trying to solve. These are the kind of areas that we need ideas in. Then you're much more likely to hear the kind of things that you need to hear. And the final point I would say is um, you need to be just honest and open and say it isn't feasible to action all ideas. Mm -hmm. And... I, as a leader, am trying to navigate this balance between really wanting and needing them, but knowing that I can't action all of them. And if I'm not going to action your idea, I'm going to tell you why and how. And I'm going to make really sure that I'm inviting you to continue that or I'm giving you some clear feedback on, you know, please, with the best will in the world, don't speak up (laughs) with your ideas unless they fit this particular model uh so those those are the sorts of areas that we're working with leaders on Uh, and i guess one of the other challenges is that um obviously everything seems to move at such a fast pace today and you know things are in constant flux so i mean it's it seems it's quite it can be quite difficult maybe to find the time to put all of these things into practice right it's very easy to forget to give feedback Mm -hmm. right it's very easy to you know, just say we can't do that right now and, and just plow straight on so how, how do you help people with that with that challenge as well yeah I think it's it's hugely tricky because in the speed of our day-to-day work we are absolutely stuck on autopilot this is where some of my research on mindful leadership comes in we're stuck stuck on automatic pilot responding in certain ways speaking up in certain ways that don't serve us and they don't serve the people around us long term, but they're easy in the moment because we're so busy and pressured. So uh, we really need to enable people to open up space where they can observe and reflect on the consequences of their current habits Mm -hmm. and help people to alter and change those habits when they want to. And it's it's a classic case of continuing on a bit crazily in the day, uh, doing stuff which seems urgent and important but actually you're setting things up just to become more and more difficult in the future. And our team dynamics and how we work and communicate and collaborate with one another sits in that in that area where people often yeah, feel like they don't have space to think about it. But of course, it makes all the sense in the world to carve out and reflect and make mm-hmm. changes in the way that we do that. Uh, but I, it, it, it is, it's the toughest thing for people to do, to step back, observe and make some tricky changes, which are going to make it easier in the future, but not necessarily right here and now. So so when you do work on, on obviously, a lot of this is to do with culture 
change, right? Or 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 identifying the culture, or even like deciding what the culture should be. I mean, a lot of organizations, culture just grows organically, right? It's never, it, there's never a deliberate, you know, people don't look at it deliberately. It just evolves over time and becomes, you know, what it is. And generally speaking, it tends to take its um, its shape from the leadership, obviously. Uh, so when you go about uh, like helping companies create a deliberate culture, um, I mean, what are some of the challenges that you face there? Because that's quite a big undertaking, right? Uh, yes. Now, my view on culture is that culture is the moment by moment interactions mm -hmm. of people today in an organization. Um, it's the habits of behavior and interaction that we learn and then perpetuate. Um, and if we wish to change organizational culture, we need to alter the choices that people are making mm -hmm. and the uh, uh, leaders in the organization, but also others, some people have a kind of louder volume control <laughs> on the culture. Uh, and, uh, and, and so part of what we want to do is sort of identify those people and work with them to say, what sort of reverberations do you want to have around here? Mm. Uh, you know, classic, what sort of shadow do you cast here? Um, and, and again, make people a little bit more aware that they they are active participants in culture. You know, we often, we talk about culture mm -hmm. as if it's a thing and it's yeah. kind of out there. And again, with our research on speaking up, it's really interesting how paralyzed an organization can become because people sit there and go, well, you know, I'm quite good at speaking up and listening up. Uh, it's just everybody else out there and the organizational culture that's the problem. And when people disassociate themselves from their own organizational culture, mm -hmm. it means that um, uh, uh, there is no way of altering or shifting it. People wait until that out there changes rather than realizing, actually, it's only going to change if I start altering the way that I behave. And so what we need to do is particularly around speaking up and listening up is is help people identify what does that mean? If you if you don't like the culture around here, what are the small experiments that you can do that start to shift those moment to moment interactions that in, in essence is organizational culture? Yeah, I think that's a great point. And I think it also it get it gets back to that idea of uh you know, people love the idea of accountability, right? I mean, if you say to people like you know, if you talk about accountability, they love the idea of accountability as long as it's you being accountable as opposed to me being starting with me being accountable right you love everybody else being accountable and i think that's kind of what you're saying is that um in any in any culture change or communication change i kind of have to take it on myself to begin with right yeah yeah so in the research uh, you know there's a so there's a label for this phenom phenomenon and it's called the superiority illusion <laughs> and uh, and our survey resoundingly shows that people generally think that they're pretty good um, yeah. and they're certainly better than everybody else around them. And that's what we tend to find with culture. You know, we blame it on them. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, and although that is, you know, that there is there is relevance in that, particularly when there are leadership teams that are misbehaving or, or sure. behaving in a, in a particular way. Uh, but we can take that too far. Uh, and so that we, you know, we just discount our own, uh, potential for altering the things around uh, around mm -hmm. us and of course it's uncomfortable to be accountable for culture especially if we don't like the culture that we're part of we suddenly have to go okay yeah, so actually I am responsible in some way mm -hmm. for the surroundings now as I said those with perceived power I would say have far more accountability on that uh, than others yeah. But the one thing that you can, you know, there's a lot of things that are outside of the control of, of, of most people. But the one thing that's completely within your control is how you choose to show up, how you choose to act and how you choose to interact. Right. Uh, yes. And um, there are limits to that because there are, you know, we work with people that are in systems that render them very you know powerless and the worst thing in the world that you can say to those individuals is well you know it's all about how you show up because <laughs> it's not because they're in a system that disables them from doing things or makes it risky or dangerous mm -hmm. to do 
different things. So it's a kind of yes and <laughs> around, around that one. Yeah, but then again, I mean, if you're in a if you're in an organisation that renders you completely powerless in the system, you have to question, and you don't like that, you have to question: Can I change it? And if I can't, why am I here? Well, and, and many, many, many people are locked into organisational work where they feel they have no consequence, no, no other option. So again, we can't go down the path of saying, well, they shouldn't, you know, should find a different job. Mm -hmm. Many people are in a position where that is just infeasible. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, uh, and that reminds me of the kind of Me Too campaign and particularly looking at um, in uh, women working, for example, in the hospitality or hotel industry and some of those individuals supporting families uh, and in positions where they can't afford to lose their job because mm -hmm. they may not be another one. So it's always, you know, there's always a, this look on the individual responsibility and the system wide responsibility and examining those uh, people with perceived power and how they how they work with that. That's fantastic. Well, listen, we're bumping up against the end of our time here, Megan. But before we go, I want to give you a chance to tell people a little bit more about you and how they can find out more and contact you. Oh, thank you very much. Um, so uh, you can find out more about me and contact me through my website, which is www.meganrates.com. And also you can find a lot more about the work on speaking up and listening up with a book that we've just published with FT Publishing, which is called Speak Up, Say What Needs to Be Said and Hear What Needs to Be Heard. Excellent. And we'll have that up on Sales Pop um, when, uh, so you can available f so you can access that and you can buy that book. Um, listen, Megan, this has been, f this has been fascinating. Uh, my name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine, Pipeline of CRM. And we'll see you all for another expert interview really soon. Thank you.